Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Best. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to tonight's Hammer Forum called Beyond the Wall. The aim of tonight's program is to envision a humane, fair, progressive, and realistic immigration policy for the United States as a counter-narrative to Trump and Miller's proposal to build a wall and close the borders. So tonight we'll try and clearly articulate an alternative narrative, something tangible and practical and ethical and inclusive. And hopefully we'll all be able to walk away with clear ideas about what's possible in an ideal world. The Hammer Forum is a monthly series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with the generous support of Andy and Branya Galef. We're joined today by Daniel Restrepo from the Center for American Progress, Jacob Sobrov from NBC News and MSNBC, USC professor Roberto Suro, and moderator Leon Krautze. Um, before we get started, I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones, and please note that taking photographs and video and audio recording are not permitted, but the video of this program and most of our programs will be available on the Hammer website, so you can share it with friends and family at any time. You should have all received some um, note cards and pencils on your way in. These are for you to write your questions on for the question and answer period. When we get closer to the Q&A, we'll send around ushers to collect your cards and bring them onto the stage. If you didn't get a note card or you need some extras, you can just raise your hands and an usher will bring you more. Please be sure to write your questions very clearly so that the moderator can read them to our guest speakers. I also want to mention a few upcoming Hammer programs you might be interested in. Uh, next Wednesday, April 23rd, we're having a special concert of gorgeous classical music by Armenian composers in observation of the anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. On May 1st, we'll have a talk about the need for diverse voices and inclusivity in building artificial intelligence computers. On May 8th, we're screening a new documentary called The Prosecutors that follows three dedicated lawyers fighting against the use of rape as a weapon of war in Bosnia, Congo, and Colombia. And on May 28th, we have another Hammer Forum looking at the rise of nonprofit journalism and the new models that are making them into very important influential news sources like ProPublica, the Texas Tribune, the Markup, the Marshall Project, and Kaiser Health News. So now on to tonight's program. I'm going to quickly introduce our speakers and then we'll get started. Daniel Restrepo is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., where his work focuses on the United States' relationship with other North and, um, North and South American countries. Restrepo served as President Barack Obama's president, uh, principal advisor on the Western Hemisphere for six years, including three and a half years as the senior director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council and as special assistant to President Obama. Restrepo focused on Latin America and the Caribbean as a member of the professional staff of the Committee on Foreign Affairs in the United States House of Representatives in the mid-90s, and today he also provides strategic and communications counsel to clients engaged in exploring um, business opportunities throughout the Americas, as well as to leaders of some of the region's key multilateral institutions. Restrepo is an on-air contributor for CNN and CNN Español, and he is a special counsel at the law firm Jones Walker LLP. Roberto Suro holds a joint appointment as a professor in the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism and the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy. Prior to that, he was the director of the Pew Hispanic Center, a research organization in Washington, D.C., which he founded in 2001. During ne nearly 30 years as a print journalist, Suro worked as a foreign and domestic bureau chief for the New York Times and at the Washington Post as deputy national editor and as a staff writer on the national desk. He's the author of several books and several dozen book chapters, research reports, and other publications related to Latinos and immigration. His commentaries appear regularly in the New York Times and other national publications, and earlier this year he published a research paper called A Migration Becomes an Emergency, The Flight of Women and Children from the Northern Triangle and Its Antecedents, which appeared in an edited volume entitled Humanitarianism and Mass Migration, published by the University of California Press. Jacob Sobrov is a reporter for, MS, for NBC News and MSNBC. As a correspondent for MSNBC, he spent months reporting from the U.S.-Mexico border on President Trump's immigration policies and was one of the first journalists to tour two South Texas facilities housing migrant children separated from their family under the administration's zero-tolerance policy. 
Amid the separation crisis, Sobarov hosted a Dateline NBC special report called The Dividing Line, which was an in-depth investigation into the separation policy and the realities of life along both sides of the border. In 2017, he was part of a NBC and MSNBC special coverage of major news events, including the inauguration, the opioid crisis, the great American eclipse, the Charlottesville attack, Hurricane Irma, the Global Citizen Festival, the Las Vegas mass shooting, and the California wildfires. Our moderator tonight is Leon Krautze. Krautze has had a diverse career in both media and academia as a journalist, an author, and as a news anchor. He anchors the nightly news for Canal 34, Univision's flagship local station here in Los Angeles. He's a columnist for the Washington Post and Slate, um, He's the author of six books, and his articles appear in Slate, The New Yorker, The Atavist, The Daily Beast, Letras Libres, and a long list of publications in both his native Mexico and the United States. He also hosts a weekly news podcast for Univision News called Epicentro, and he co-hosts the podcast Real Trumpcast for Slate. He's received multiple accolades for his journalistic work, including eight Emmys, as well as the Edward R. Murrow, LA Press Club, and Golden Mike Awards. Over the last two years, he held the prestigious Wallace Annenberg Chair in Journalism at USC, where he's now a senior fellow at the Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy. So now please join me in welcoming Dan Restrepo, Jacob Sobrov, Roberto Suro, and moderator Leon Kratze. Okay, wonderful. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back at the Hammer to moderate what will be a, an urgent and interesting conversation. Uh, I'll begin with a brief introduction to the, to the topic. As a, as a Mexican immigrant, as a Mexican journalist who works for Univision, I have followed Donald Trump's descent into outright nativism with authentic dread. It took Trump exactly 100 seconds, I, I counted him, <laughs> to begin attacking Mexico uh, four years ago when he first launched his presidential campaign after descending that golden escalator at Trump Tower, and he hasn't stopped since then. It has been four years of nativist fear-mongering, immigrant bashing, and hateful rhetoric. Trump has been, as we all know, relentless in laying out a punitive agenda against immigrants, against refugees, against undocumented immigrants and legal immigrants alike. Simply put, he has become something never before seen quite like this in American political life, an outright nativist president. In so doing, Trump has surrounded himself with the most radical anti-immigrant people available in the American political scene, the horsemen of the apocalypse, Jeff Sessions, Chris Kovac, Stephen Miller, you name it, they're there or have been there right next to the president. It is clear by now that Trump plans to ride this nativist wave of his all the way to 2020. And uh, why shouldn't he? Most Republicans currently agree with him in a number that terrifies me. 75% of Republican voters currently identify immigration as the biggest problem the country faces. Not opioid addiction, not salary disparity, not gun violence, immigration. Three out of four Republicans. So the, questions, the, the question we're here to, to answer tonight is how should the Democratic Party respond? Is it enough to be merely against Trump on this issue of uh, his nativist anti-immigrant rhetoric? What should the democratic agenda on immigration look like in 2020? And I'm joined by a truly stellar panel to try to answer these very complicated questions. So le let me first ask you, uh, Roberto, how did we get here? It's, it's a big question, but let's set the scene because it's important. How do you explain just how resonant Trump's nativist message has been among his base? Why did nativism find such an such an echo this time around. There has, there has been other nativist politicians in the American political scene before, from Buchanan to lesser known people like Tom Tancredo, that crazy congressman from Colorado. Why this time around? 
Well, I mean, um, I'll start by correcting you on one point. Yes. The first nativist president was John Adams, who enacted the Alien and Sedition Acts, probably the most most nativist piece of legislation the United States has ever Let me passed. write that down. He was our second president. Um, nativism is a very old, persistent strain of American political thought. It comes and goes, it rises and falls, it never disappears entirely. Sometimes it comes to, it's very vivid as it is now, but uh, this is not, the first thing to remember is this is not unique. Trump is not all that imaginative, he didn't make this up. Um, it's in the response. Uh, generated by that kind of rhetoric is also something we've seen often before. I mean, there have been several really significant episodes. We don't need to get out into the entire history. In understanding nativism, I think the one important point is not to focus on the object of the nativism, whether it's Mexicans or Central Americans or Muslims, which is in fact indicative. It can switch targets. It's very malleable. In the, in the 19th century, it could be Catholics, could be anarchists, could be Jews, could be anybody sometimes in the same breath. Trump flips, flipped from Mexicans to Muslims, now it's Central American women, he does, it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. it's not about the target. It's about the person who's enunciating it and their view of themselves, not their view of other people. So it's a matter of self-identity. It goes to the heart of nationalism and the expressions of nationalism. And in this case, it's a dark nationalism. It always has been. It's a measure of insecurity. It's a lack of self-confidence. People think that nativism is this boastful, sort of imperious form of nationalism. It's the opposite. It is a country that's not great. It's a country that's in the midst of carnage. It's a country that feels assaulted, insecure, and, and sees enemies within the walls. Um, so it is an expression of insecurity. Um, and of a lack of a confident, well-articulated sense of national identity. The antidote to it is not to scream racism and xenophobia, but to articulate a form of nationalism that is confident, that is forward-looking, that says we don't need to be afraid. We're not a, a, a fearful people. We can look at the world, we can look at ourselves, we can look at our problems and say we can handle this. We've done it before. That's the antidote. And or the other ver the other things, the other ways it's been handled in the past is to compromise with it. I mean, to cut deals. That was done early in the 20th century. Um, and Or to defeat it entirely, as was done basically during the Civil War. I mean, it, I mean it, you, you have, um, but we don't need to go there. For the moment, I'd say the, the problem and the reason why this view goes uncontested um, is because you don't have somebody getting up and, and saying to the American people, I mean, th I mean, I, you know, this is, this is the progressive, we're supposed to be pro doing a progressive view. Well, look at Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. and what he said to the American people. That message now is the best counter to nativism. Dan? No, I, I, I think it's important um, and, and wholeheartedly agree with what Roberto was just saying, that to understand that this, and actually I understand the lessons, the good and the bad lessons, that this is not new in American politics. Um, and that's disturbing that it's not new in American politics. Uh, we'd like to think um, that we've been above this sort of thing in the past, but we haven't. I mean, I, um, Ben Franklin spoke of Germans in colonial Pennsylvania in the way that Donald Trump speaks of Mexicans and Central Americans, that they were sending their, stu their, their dumbest people, that if we weren't careful, we would speak German instead of them speaking English. I mean, kind of, if, if, if Ben Franklin had had a Twitter feed um, on immigration, it wouldn't have been particularly different than Donald Trump's. Um, so, so there are other moments in time, and, and, and quite frankly, as a, as a country, we seem to get particularly nervous and particularly nativist um, when the foreign-born population exceeds 14% of the population. Um, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect um, um, kind of one-to-one, -one, but it's when, when the, when the foreign-born population and other things, and, and I'm going to go to the other things in particular, um, I wholeheartedly agree that articulation of, of what it means to be American today um, and kind of the greatness of this country is the antidote to kind of a fearful, um, othering po set of politics. Um, the ground is fertile at the moment for othering politics 
in some way because of a kind of fundamental breakdown in public policy responses to kind of decades of stagnation for the middle class in the United States, um, made more precipitous by the 2008-2009 um, financial crisis and economic crisis that followed. Uh, and there has been no particularly well-articulated policy response to that, that people have faith in actually making their lives better and impacting their lives more directly. And absent that, and this is true in the United States, this is true kind of in all Western democracies. I mean, th that's the other thing to keep in mind right now, that this the United States isn't being particularly novel or unique right now in terms of being fertile for a nativist, for nativist discourse. And part of, the f part of the fault and part of the remedy um, has to go to this kind of broader public policy question, this broader public po policy question of the changing nature of work um, and how societies are going to deal with that going forward um, that has a lot of people very uncomfortable, and rightly so. Uh, um, and, but there is no good set of policy proposals as to how we're going to address that. It leaves a lot of open space. People fill that open space. Um, with this othering rhetoric um, that we see from the president. Um, that we've seen Muslims, we've seen Mexicans, we've seen Central Americans. The Colombians made a cameo appearance over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, all of a sudden, uh, I was in Colombia last week and they were very chagrined that they are now part of the nativist uh, rundown. <laughs> um, I'm kind of wondering how that happened and I, helped, I tried explaining to them that it wasn't, really it wasn't about them. There was nothing, they, there's nothing, and, and I've been saying this actually, it, it, when the president is talking about Mexico and Mexicans, he's, not, he's talking about neither Mexico nor Mexicans. Um, and I think that's really important to understand, that he's not talking about that. He's, as Roberto he's very, about he's us. talking about us, he's talking about himself, and he's talking about the people who feel that uncertainty, and he is feeding that uncertainty um, because he doesn't have a real answer. Jacob, you, you've covered the border uh, like very few people. You were one of the first to tell the brutal story of family separation. Dan says Trump is actually talking about us. How do you explain the way that this, this nativist narrative has, has taken hold? I just mentioned this number, this three out of four Republicans believe immigration is the biggest threat the, 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 the country currently faces. How do you explain it? A couple things. First of all, sorry for the old dude panel. We talked about this backstage. We want to mention it. Uh, secondly, <laughs> This has nothing to do with this panel, but the last time I was in this room was for a free, I was telling them also backstage, was for a free guided meditation. Claudia, what day of the week is that? I highly recommend it, especially after listening to a panel like this. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, what do I think? I think that before I covered the border, I covered the um, 2016 election and then again the 2018 election after um, family separations. And despite what the president says, or even what President Obama said, there are a lot of people who are really struggling in this country and they feel very alienated from, um, from everything, from us and the media, you know? I understand why people um, distrust the news media and what they see on television. I understand why they distrust the institution in Washington, D.C. And I think that President Trump, like these guys have been saying, has done a pretty masterful job of blaming uh, immigrants for the problems that uh, most of these folks uh, feel like they have. Um, and actually, Chris Hayes, my colleague, makes a really good point is when you're down on the border, um, you don't hear people talk the way Donald Trump does. The further you get away from the border, the more people talk um, the way that Donald Trump does about immigrants and about his, his reality, which is not the reality of life along the southern border and what it really, um, and what it really looks like. And so I think that a part of the challenge is that we have a lack of access to realities on the ground and what's really going on. And so that's why you know, I'm grateful to have this job. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to go see you know, the worst thing I've ever seen in my life, which was the children locked up in the cages um, you know, under the Mylar blankets, watched by security guard contractors in the watchtower because um, I learned who they really were. And they're not who Donald Trump says they are. Uh, and most of the people coming across the border are not who Donald Trump says they are. He, right now, his latest thing is, uh, it's a fraud and a hoax, the asylum system. And if you always spend a lot of time asking uh, DHS for uh, one particular statistic over and over, they wouldn't give it to us until just recently, fraudulent family units, which is the definition of a hoax or a fraud when people present themselves when they come across the border. And the percentage of, uh, over the course of the last year, the percentage of um, 
hoax, fraud families, people that come and lie about who they are and who they're coming with and how old they are, is less than 1%. And so he, he makes deterrence-based immigration policy, horrific, horrific policies um, based on uh, what are frauds coming out of his own mouth. Um, and so I think that if we had a better understanding of what, what is really going on, if Americans had a better understanding of what's really going on, part of that is on us, um, you wouldn't see attitudes like this, or at least as much. Although his base doesn't necessarily watch you on MSNBC. <laughs> no. So, but it's not hard for any news organization to send somebody down to the border to say, look, these are the safest... It's to be a real news organization. Yeah, right. These are, these are... Anybody can do it. These are some of the safest communities in America um, with some of the most welcoming people. Uh, and, and, uh, and the border is just not a war zone. It's just not even close to it. And it's, it's really an easy thing to do. All you got to do is go look with your own eyeballs. Um, but too many outlets uh, don't spend enough time doing it. And I, think that, I really do think that that's part of the problem. Let me ask you all about uh, the, the, liberal, the liberal response to, to Trump. So up till now, with just a few, I would say, notable exceptions, very few, we haven't seen a, a lucid and powerful progressive counter-narrative to, to Trump's uh, nativist onslaught. Why, Roberto? How do you explain the silence, at least the relative silence? Um, I mean, I would say um, there are I mean, well, a number of reasons. One, uh, a, a very clear, admitted, open, strategic decision was made last year not to engage on immigration going into the 2018 election. I mean, Nancy Pelosi was absolutely explicit about it. I mean, she said, we are campaigning on health care. Uh, I mean, Trump challenged the notion of birthright citizenship, which has been doctrine for the Democratic Party for I don't know how long. Nobody said a word. I mean, they exercise total discipline in not talking about it. Um, the other reason is, I mean, among other reasons, uh, the Democratic Party has baggage on this um, in that the Obama administration in 2014 um, undertook a number of policies that are in, in strategy, the same strategy that uh, Trump is applying, which is primarily a deterrent strategy. You, you create a gauntlet. Um, with the idea that only the most worthy will survive and you'll filter out the weak um, and fraudulent cases, which I mean, in some cases are identity, but also if a claim is made up, you could claim that it was, I mean, somebody alleging they, they lived in a place and witnessed something which they didn't. In any case, um, it's, so the deterrent strategy, including the use of detention, including the locking up of families under circumstances that provoked lawsuits, and judicial findings that the administration was violating people's rights um, is part of the democratic baggage going into this. Um, you have not had what I think is essential, uh, which is Democrats standing up and saying the, f the starting point is rejecting deterrence as the foundation of a, str of a policy. That, we're, that our aim is not, we don't structure everything around the idea that we can make things so difficult and so adversarial for asylum seekers that that's the way we exercise control. Um, so, and, and there haven't been um, Democrats willing to do that except for those who offer the alternative you could be under the, the broad rubric of abolish ICE, which is basically abolish control but not replace it. Mm -hmm. um, and the danger there is, um, you know, that the, the um, the, the headless heart, as it's called in the migration trade. Um, and if you, have an, if you have a headless heart um, and you create chaos um, and actually can end up creating worse outcomes for the migrants. So consider Germany in 2015. Angela Merkel decided to open the doors um, in what was a headless heart move um, and it created chaos. And it also meant the door was open and then it was shut, and shut tighter than it was before. Um, and in the, in the midst of it, you remember the scenes on the beaches in Greece. Uh, you, 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 it's very dangerous to create um, situations that have no control. Uh, migrants ought to have an orderly process where they know if they've got a claim, they can make it, they can make it in a sane manner, and that there's some order. And we can talk later about how to accomplish that. We will. 
Um, the other, the, the last piece on Democrats, I would say, is that there's, you, you had the party was, had one, one idea, comprehensive immigration reform, God bless it, it <laughs> came and went, you know, and, and it's time to move on. Um, and you still have lots and lots of Democrats, including most of the presidential candidates, when you, they have a three word answer to any question about immigration. We need comprehensive immigration reform. And that's, that will solve everything. And until we do that, we can't address anything. That, it's a dead letter. Those three words should never be said in that order. I mean, you can come up with other plans, but that idea, tried several times, dead. Um, and the lack of a new idea is the problem. Jacob? I was just gonna say, Roberto brought up deterrence, and that's, that I think is the key word that Democrats own as much as Republicans do, and they don't just own it in President Obama's administration. It goes back uh, at least to President Clinton when the official name of the Border Patrol policy was prevention through deterrence. Yeah. That was the first wave of infrastructure um, walls uh, that went up in the San Diego, Tijuana area and other areas across the border that certainly led to a decrease um, in crossings, but also led to an increase in migrants at the time, mostly Mexicans, crossing through more dangerous and deadly areas. And while you saw the numbers of uh, migrants crossing the border declining, apprehensions declining is the metric that, that you would use in that instance, the number of people dying in the deserts uh, were going up. And the separation policy is sort of the most extreme reprehensible version of a deterrence policy uh, that you could have. But over the course of every administration since then, different deterrence policies um, have been uh, experimented with. Um, in the Obama administration, it was detaining uh, families, uh, mothers with their children, until it was deemed illegal. And that's what, that's what President Obama now wants to do. Again, the bottom line is deterrence doesn't work. Um, uh, President Trump, rather. Um, uh, it, the bottom line is deterrence doesn't work. If it worked, um, if it worked, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, and the thing, I actually didn't know this. Dan Bryan knows a lot more about this than I do, but I was looking at, and that's the thing. That's why it's so crazy that President Trump says, okay, we're going to do all these deterrence policies, but we're going to cut foreign aid to the Northern Triangle countries. Because, and again, Dan Bryan knows way more about this than I do, but during Obama's Central American, in particular, uh, unaccompanied minor surge, um, after an infusion of foreign aid to the Northern Triangle countries, and in particular El Salvador, I think it was like 50,000 migrant difference in a two-year period coming from El Salvador. So the idea that um, deterrence in and of itself is going to stop this and you're going to cut foreign aid is just an absolute upside-down uh, solution, I think, to what the problem is. And by the way, the, the, the amount we're talking about is almost ridiculous. I mean, $750 million dollars. Uh, uh, and, and it's now $435 million for the three countries, for the Northern Triangle. We, we'll talk about that. But, uh, yeah. Dan, uh, I want to ask you about uh, uh, this recent essay, uh, honestly, eloquently written by, by David Froome in The Atlantic. He, he, he says, and I quote, if liberals don't enforce the border, fascists will. Should Democrats embrace enforcement? No. Um, I, I think... I think, I think Democrats, liberals, progressives, however you want to, to speak of them, and as someone who represents a 501c3 organization, I'll speak of progressives and liberals and not Democrats. Um, it's a charity, guys. <laughs> it's a charity, yes. Uh, um, that is, it cannot be partisan in our activities. Um, I think it's, I think it is, I think it is, I think one of the, one of the traps that, um, quite frankly, the Obama administration in, our, in, our, in the first term while I was there fell into was this notion going back to the mantra of comprehensive immigration reform, was that we could be tough enough at the border um, and we could, do we could do enough enforcement that the other side would give us the part of comprehensive immigration reform we wanted, right? That there was a good faith negotiation to be had. And that's, sorry to interrupt you, and that's when President Obama deported, I mean, ultimately, yeah. President Obama deported more Deporter people in chief, than any, yes. exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. any people, any, any so, migrants so, than any president. So, but but it, it, there was a false premise there, that there was a good faith negotiation to be had on this issue. Um, and I think it's really important to take that lesson away, that there is not a good faith negotiation to be had on this issue, that you can't be, quote unquote, tough enough um, because, again, you're not really talking. One of the fascinating things, if you go back and look at the comprehensive immigration debates 
um, when when the Senate took up uh, legislation at different points in the 2000s. Um, and you go and read the debates and see what people were actually talking about. Um, they're remarkable. They're, they're not talking about immigration a whole lot. Um, they end up talking about economic insecurity and kind of all of these other kind of public policy failures I was mentioning earlier. Uh, if you look at the text of the debate of senators actually on the floor of the United States Senate ostensibly debating about comprehensive immigration reform, um, weren't actually talking about immigration. Um, and so I don't think, I, I, I think David Frum is, is incorrect. I think there is a minimum amount of work and we're well past the minimum amount of work that needs to be done um, in, from a security perspective on any port of entry to the United States and any border. Um, both of our land borders require a certain amount of security. Um, but to think that we can be tough enough or out-tough the other side or match the other side's toughness on this um, is a fool's errand. Um, and and it's not only is a fool's errand, I think it ends up leading the whole conversation in a very destructive, to, to a very destructive place. Because you're having the conversation on the wrong terms at that point. Can I, 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 let me pick up on that because it's exactly where I wanted to go. So Frum's argument, which has been echoed oddly enough in the last 10 days or so by two people who have rarely agreed on much, <laughs> Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, um, have both adopted the from argument, which says we are seeing more forcibly displaced people around the world than there ever has been before. If you want to do a, a Bernie kind of thing. And they're coming. And they're coming. <laughs> they're coming for the West. You know, they're coming and they're 60 odd million uh, displaced persons. The number is bogus and complicated. Most of them are in the south and they're going in the southern hemisphere and they're going to other places and they're staying in the southern hemisphere. The number of forced migrants coming from south to north is actually quite small. But beyond that, migration is not a universal phenomenon. Never has been, never will be. It's very specific. Yeah. It's between one place and another place at a specific time and with specific channels and very discrete characteristics. The United States is not Germany. Guatemala is not Syria. Conflating these things leads you to this vision to become sort of apocalyptic. And so in the words of Bernie Sanders, we can't have open borders because all the poor people in the world will be coming trying to come here. You know, Hillary Clinton, we can't have, we, Germany can't have open borders because look, this produces nativism and a populist backlash. They're both wrong because the world is the world is not on the move trying to just get all to one place. You compare Europe and the United States, and this goes to the enforcement question, they're sitting on top of a big problem. I mean, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Southwest Asia, there are millions and millions of people living in circumstances where forced displacement is is likely or even inevitable. We've got three really little countries. I mean, tiny little places. Um, the, um, the enforcement, the immigration enforcement budget of the United States is the equivalent of the entire GDP of Honduras and El Salvador. These are teensy places. I mean, and with small populations. And we have an enormous enforcement machinery existing that is actually quite good. Um, it helps stifle the Mexican labor migration. The recession knocked it down. Yeah. The enforcement <laughs> kept it from getting up. Right. Um, and, and we have Mexico the, it's stopping the 2014 surge. It wasn't aid to Central America that stopped it. It was the previous government of Mexico that stopped it. You know, I mean, brutally too. And, and, and we and should say, yeah, so, uh, just uh, on that, Mexico, and Donald Trump says Mexico now is just finally you know, waking up and starting to help deport uh, Central Americans. Right. Mexico, since I believe right. 2015, has deported uh, more Central more Americans. Central Americans, more Central United Americans. United States, and, yes. and not only that, yeah. double the United States uh, in some of those years. Right. So, the, one, this goes, uh, the, uh, the bottom line, one important thing to keep in mind of this is to keep the problem in the proper dimensions. It, in, in, mm -hmm. it, you know, part of what Trump does, what a nativist has to do, is greatly exaggerate the problem um, and, and greatly underestimate our resources for managing it. 
we're dealing, I mean, there's a surge now. There's significant numbers. This is because the whole thing was terribly mishandled. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, if, if Stephen Miller and Trump actually understood immigration or understood the tools they had, they would have been able to deal with this much more effectively far longer ago. But it's not, it's not vast. These are little countries. We have a lot of tools to manage it. It's not a time to panic. And the population of Egypt isn't on its way. I, 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 didn't, re I didn't read the David Frum article, frankly. Uh, and, uh, but I do want to talk about Donald Trump's role in all this. There was a mini surge in the last months of President Obama's administration. And folks inside the DHS apparatus call, referred to that time as the Trump effect. So basically, there was a big spike, and then it dropped off in the beginning of Donald Trump's term. And they called both of those mini surges and then a dip, um, the Trump effect, because they said Donald Trump's rhetoric was so extreme, it freaked out people that would normally come here and people stayed home. Nobody's calling what's happening now the Trump effect, but it is a second Trump effect because everybody, uh, and you hear news reports of saying on the news, in the newspapers, this is your last chance at going because Donald Trump is going to stop migration as we know it gonna, to the United States. He's going to close the border. He's going to close the border. He says it himself. Yeah. And so the idea that Donald Trump's um, administration, people around him, he himself don't see that, or at least they don't want to acknowledge it, um, is, is pretty ridiculous because the words that are coming out of his mouth are encouraging people to come here as if it's their last best uh, hope. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you want to hear alternatives. Uh, what can the Democrats do to counter the situation? So let's talk about alternatives. Uh, Julian Castro and, and Bernie Sanders uh, recently have said that the next administration should should focus resources on on uh, uh, building new shelters, increasing the number of immigration judges. Does that sound like a, like a, like a platform, uh, Roberto? A sensible plat. Let, let's start with Dan. Uh, a sensible platform for 2020 when it comes to immigration. If they do decide to talk about it, I think they will. They will have. No other choice, by the way. So as a, as a matter of politics, um, probably not. I think what you've seen so far are, pro are policy proposals um, of how you would actually manage the situation, both the immediate situation, which actually does require more immigration judges and lawyers, um, to you know every immigration judge in the country right now has approximately 2,100 cases um, that they're responsible for. Um, so there's a huge lag in the system. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> that that's not going to go away magically. Um, so you are going to need more lo more judges and lawyers to to work through that um, to get to a place where you can process claims, respecting people's rights um, in a way that has a faster turnaround to it, um, because that'll help managing migration. Um, Julian Castro, I know, talks about also investing in um, Central America in mm -hmm. the Northern Triangle. Um, the management of migration from the Northern Triangle must begin in the Northern Triangle. Um, and there, too, kind of there's a huge rule of law deficit. There's a real um, lack of oper economic opportunity. Um, you have unbelievably uh, predatory private sectors in those three countries um, that carry a decent amount of the blame here. Um, you have the legacy of, of U.S. policy decisions from the past that also um, have some responsibility. Um, for the conditions that exist in those countries. So you have to do much more. Um, I had the opportunity to sit in on a meeting that President Obama had with the then president of, of El Salvador. And at the time, the president of El Salvador was talking about, look, the young people in his country, and this was probably um, in 2011, um, had two options, right? They had, as they kind of came of age, their options were um, to join in urban, in urban, it's a gang. Uh, 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 yes, join a gang or go north. Um, and he, the president at the time, um, Mauricio Funes, said, "You know, we have a fundamental responsibility to create a third option here, right? That people can live live their lives where they were born." Um, so actually, managing the problem, managing the dynamic, um, has to start in communities in the region. Um, it also has the added benefit that it works, um, it can work. Reducing violence, uh, as Jacob talked about earlier, um, has real effects on migration from these countries. Um, it's not all violence driven, right? There's a, there's a drought problem in the western highlands of Guatemala at the moment um, that's climate driven, um, that is a 
quite frankly, a harder problem to solve um, in terms of managing that migration. But American Aid has proven very <coughs> successful. Yes, we, we just read an incredible piece, wonderful piece by Jonathan Blitzer in The New Yorker yep. describing how in the western highlands of, of Guatemala, actual, actual American money, and, and when I say American money, I'm talking about $200,000 yeah, not, yeah, I was saying, not a lot of money. Yeah. $200,000 right. to save a community right. yeah. that has been terribly affected right. by drought and, and climate fluctuations. So it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, change can happen through. Yeah. Right. But it, it's going to, I mean, it's, it's, uh, am I, no, right, so, I mean, it's, there's no question that substantial investments, both in money, expertise, uh, diplomacy, across the board has to be invested um, in Central America for a variety of reasons. I mean, starting with the fact that it's our neighborhood um, and that these are countries we've been engaged in deeply since before they were countries. Um, but no matter how well structured or how well resourced efforts to address root causes would be, it's gonna take time. I mean, Reestablishing rule of law in El Salvador is a generational project. The economic stuff- And it would stuff, be establishing. Yeah, right, and so the economic stuff you could do much quicker. But there are other issues that are gonna take time. In the meanwhile, there's gonna be a migration, and it's gonna continue, and you need ways to deal with it. The asylum system was never designed, was not meant to, and should never be a large-scale portal. It, it is a very specific, honorable, beautiful tool that, that has very specific purposes and it should be for very, it's designed for small numbers of people, which is why it chokes whenever you get large numbers. We have other, it, it, it was not designed to, to, even as a primary vehicle for a humanitarian migration. Right. The United States has many other tools. The tool that has been used repeatedly in the past up until the 1980s was, it, and in fact, in American tradition, the way we have dealt with humanitarian migrations is with ad hoc group policies. We don't, we were late signatories to the 51 convention. We've never, we, we have never held to big normative standards. We have made practical, foreign policy driven, self-interested decisions on humanitarian migrations. We have said Soviet Jews, South Vietnamese, um, a variety of other ca you know, categories of people. We've also said no to people, German Jews, we said no. Um, we have done it through statute, um, and you can, you can create portals um, that allow lots of people in at a time that are not individual processing. So you're not going, you don't need all the manpower. You, you could create legislation that said any woman uh, with a child from Central America who has relatives in the United States, you create a visa. We, we are very good at this. I mean, our immigration system is endlessly malleable. We can, you can do humanitarian temporary visas, give somebody a two-year work permit, the young men. We're gonna give you two years. TPS? Here to keep what? The way TPS Or you can use TPS, it's a version of it. You can parole people in. We've done all kinds of things. I mean, there's a toolbox that's enormous and very, and it's designed to give a lot of options. L the but first thing is to say, get, you don't increase the immigration judges. You don't try and fix it through the asylum system. You say the asylum system, we're gonna take 90% of those migrants out of the asylum system and find other portals for them. And you let the asylum system do what it's designed to do. Very specific people with very specific criteria. The rest of this population, very much mixed motives. There's a lot of family unification. There's a lot of economic um, lead driven migration and overlaid with the humanitarian aspect. But you're, it's, every time you hear a Democratic candidate say the answer is to hire more immigration judges, all that leads you back to deterrence. It leads you back to the same dead end we're in. You can't hire your way out of this problem. You have to find, and we have great tools Mm -hmm. to do this otherwise. Jacob, you want to add something? No, I was just thinking about, I actually have a question, <laughs> this is what happens when you have too many journalists on the panel, but I have a question <laughs> for you guys, um, and to explain to you guys, I don't know, maybe you guys know, but so the two rules, laws, that the Trump administration wants to get around or change, one is, um, they call it Flores, and that's what dictates that you can only hold migrant families, parents and their children, uh, in detention for 20 days. And the Trump administration wants to 
Uh, and that happened during the Obama administration because the Obama administration tried to hold families for longer than 20 days. Um, the Trump administration wants to hold families indefinitely. Well, eight weeks. Eight, is that what they say? Eight weeks. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's what they're asking Congress for. Well, right. But if they help, whether it's eight weeks or indefinitely, because I thought it was the entirety of their, their asylum proceedings. Well, these people do say a lot of different things. But I mean, the, the I think that's what they're trying now. The, what Jacob the, is talking. The, about. the professionals at DHS have a proposal that asks for eight weeks, and then you go to last in, first out processing. Um, you don't even address the backlog. You just process people in, in eight weeks. You get them in and out with with less than twenty percent approval rates, which is what you get out of the asylum system. So there's so there's Flores and then there's TVPRA, which, and what, which is a trafficking protection. And what the what the Trump administration would like to do, as far as that's concerned, is be able to turn around Central American undocumented minors the minute they get here and be able to deport them immediately. Is that an accurate characterization? Instead of allow them to come in and go into the HHS system uh, and be supervised by um, child welfare, essentially, right? That's my I, understanding. I, I, so, yeah. question for you is: That's the conversation they want to have, right? Because they, I mean, I think they make in public the case that they're making is this is the quote unquote loophole, which is actually just the law that everybody's exploiting in order to come into this country. What you're saying is, don't even have a conversation about that at all. Make it about something else entirely, basically. Yeah. Oh, I think. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I mean, a having a conversation with the Trump administration about immigration is kind of ludicrous. I mean, they, they it, you know, their policy is do something, do anything, build a wall, do this, do that, lock them up, don't lock them up, send them back, send, have them stay in Mexico. I mean, it's a million different things, and none of them stick. They change, close the border, don't close the border, one-year warning. I mean, I think that's a distraction. I mean, I don't think you should, you should deal with this guy. Have an affirmative policy, and the affirmative policy is not to say that you can build a bigger, better asylum system that can handle these kinds of numbers efficiently, because it's never going to happen. Right. You know, and it's it, the asylum system is inherently adversarial, right? So you arrive, you say, I am making a claim that this happened to me, and as a result of that, I have a well-founded fear of persecution in my home country. I can't go back. The burden of guilt is on you. It's that you are guilty until proven innocent. You are assumed to be a fraud unless you can prove that you did it. It's not a good system. It's not meant for this. We have many other tools that are much better designed to deal with this kind of situation. So all that to say, actually, when it comes back to, so that's policy. The politics, if I was the Democrats, I would, I would come up with something, but then not make that the thing that I talk about. I mean, you got to talk about, you have to give the people who Donald Trump has scared into believing him um, a reason to think that their life can be better without having this as the big bad Boogeyman. Uh, that's and and that's yeah. that's where I, I wanted to get at for 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 uh, the the conclusion of our conversation before the Q and A, which is, what is a sensible uh, narrative for the Democrats to have uh, during the electoral process? Because one thing is to talk to the Trump administration about policy. I agree with you; they are all over the place. But when it comes to politics, it's a different matter. Nativism sells, at least within the Republican base. I do believe that the Democratic Party has to develop some sort of counter-narrative. What do you talk about? What's a winning strategy? Uh, is it a winning strategy, a winning narrative to talk about nation building in Central America? Will that sell no. in the Rust Belt? What do you talk about? Well, I mean, there's a question of whether Democrats really should be trying to talk to Republican voters in the Rust Belt to begin with. And, and the other thing, I mean... But there are some people that you have to convince. Okay, not Trump voters, uh, right. if, if you want to give, uh, give up on them. Yeah, but there, there's, there's a bunch of voters that right. will listen to immigration, that, that count on this issue. Yeah, and, right. so, and more people stay home. This is the most important point. More people stay home and don't vote than correct. the amount of people that come out and vote. And right. the re back to what I was saying at the beginning, the reason people don't vote is they don't trust the system and they don't believe that there's a solution to the problems in their lives. And immigration is one big scary thing. But it's like, hey, immigrants make your lives better. And now, you know how you drive a Lyft and an Uber and also have another job? Here's my plan so you don't have to do that. I mean, that's how you're going to get people out to vote and show yeah. up and, and, yeah. and win an election. It's not talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I, I, I mean, I think, yeah. the, I think the 
midterm strategy of focusing on health care and other issues that resonate with people and the, particularly those people that you need to motivate um, to participate um, is a much better from a for just pure kind of brute politics perspective of address those underlying economic insecurities um, that people have um, while presenting an affirmative vision of who we are as a country. Like I think those two things yeah. together need to be part of the part of a narrative as the counter narrative, rather than getting into some sort of argument about how to manage migration into the United States. Um, that that's not it's not a front line issue for a lot of persuade. I'd be very surprised if it's a front line issue for a lot of persuadable voters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree about the politics of this, and and you know, you've you've cited the, made the Republicans into kind of a boogeyman, right? So 75% of Republican voters gets you to what, 30% of the electorate? Yep. Maybe less? Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, In so- In California, 7%. Yeah, well, California is, <laughs> we're, we're not we're really get, part of it. We're somewhere else. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's, it's not, I mean, the, the, the difference is that those voters, for those voters, it's their top issue and they'll, they'll vote on it. You've got the rest of the country, by very large numbers, consistently, the, the public attitudes towards immigration have not changed. Yep. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. Trump got yes. elected, four years of this rhetoric, all the craziness at the border. Has, has not moved. American attitudes towards immigration have not changed, and they are overwhelmingly welcoming on specific issues like legalization, on broad issues, immigrants help or hurt the country, mm -hmm. on how many immigrants we should be admitting, the same, more or less. <laughs> you, there are time series surveys that go back 20 years on this stuff, and there's no question that the, the American people overall are cool with this whole thing. You know, so, and that's important to recognize. And there are, there are, there are gonna be debates, and the question's gonna come up. You'll ask it. Somebody will ask it of these presidential right. candidates, and and so they need a response. Yeah. And it and it can't be more asylum. I mean, you, it, we, you, it'll take too long to present the affirmative case, but part of it has to do with saying we can handle this. You know, we're okay. We can actually. This is not a big problem. We have the resources, the space, the capabilities. Right. You could say send them all to the sanctuary cities, and that's okay. <laughs> you should I mean, you should yeah. uh, prep them because I, honestly, I mean, you make the case better than I've heard it from a lot of well, that's a lot of Democrats. Yeah. And what can I say? And and <laughs> can I just tell one quick story that I think is exactly what we're talking about? I went to Tornillo. We did this story on the Today Show, and I went to Tornillo, which is where they had the tent camp, where the Trump administration over the summer stood at the tent camp, primarily because they were separating kids and the system and HHS was overflowing. And I went to talk to a pomegranate farmer who was the biggest pomegranate orchard or the only one in El Paso County, and it's like a five minute drive from Tornillo. And I said, this was for the midterms, and that's a contested district, Will Hurd ultimately yeah. beat Gene Ortiz Jones by 973 votes. Yeah. And because Beto, side story, but because right. probably because Beto yeah. didn't uh, endorse Gene Ortiz Jones. And I said to the pomegranate farmer, you know, what matters most to you? Is it those kids in the, uh, in the tent camp? And by the way, that's the answer that I hope that he would have, right. uh, having, been through all this and covered all this, and he's like, no, I, I'm worried about my pomegranates, whether or not I can sell my pomegranates, and he said, it was horrible, he's like, those kids have to eat, and I got to sell my pomegranates. People are motivated by their own self-interest, yeah. and as much as I wish that immigration would be the number one topic that people think about, it's, it's the number one topic for people that hate immigrants for no good reason, and for everybody else, it's just not the top, top issue, and that's the reality. Let's let's get some uh, some questions. I, I have them here, very uh, interesting ones. So let's try to be very succinct in our in our answers. Uh, more and there are more questions. More questions. Fantastic, <laughs> thank you. So uh, question: Ice Ice seems to have some barbaric, sadistic employees. <laughs> <laughs> is it Ice or is it bad apples? And if it's Ice, what do we replace it with? I would add uh, another question. Is abolish ICE also an interesting narrative for Democrats? I think it's not, by the way. But do you think it should be mentioned during the campaign? It will be mentioned during the convention, I'm sure, by some people. What? So ICE, uh, Dan, 
ICE. Um, I, abolish ICE is an emotion, not a policy. Um, and it is an emotion that resonates in parts of the Democratic base. Um, it does not, I'd imagine, resonate with a lot of persuadable voters in America. Um, the biggest challenge that ICE has today, so DHS itself is a, is a challenge. Um, so DHS is the first time we've tried standing up a new department in the United States <laughs> federal government in quite some time. Um, and right, exactly, in the middle of a crisis, um, and it's a disaster of an organization. Um, and I worked every day um, of three and a half very long years at the White House with DHS. Um, and it's not a department, it's a bunch of entities um, that were thrown together that still now, 18 years later, um, have not formed any coherence. Um, and there's a kind of fundamental leadership challenge and in entities that are in the enforcement business, um, and ICE is the most is the clearest one, um, that leadership challenge um, manifests itself in um, allowing space for bad actors and allowing space for um, activities that are beyond the pale, even when you have leadership that's trying to rein it in. Um, and it becomes particularly problematic when you have leadership that's trying to empower it. Um, so uh, the, the, the fundamental challenge of ICE, I think, today is the mission and the manner in which that mission is being conveyed to the line officers um, nestled in this kind of broader leadership challenge um, that is the Department of Homeland Security. Um, someone is going to have to do some enforcement work. Like that's not, that, that, that function cannot be kind of disappeared um, <laughs> from activities. Um, and as a result, you, you, but you do need to do it with effective leadership um, and effective, quite frankly, vetting of people who are coming in the door. Um, we've also grown a lot of these enforcement mechanisms um, too rapidly, um, too much driven by politics. Um, where the ability to recruit, hire, and retain um, quality individuals from top to bottom has been a challenge. Um, and that's true in all of the enforcement-related entities that fall under the Department of Homeland Security. So, so ICE is an entry-level job in law enforcement. Uh, people go into ICE, the Border Patrol even more so, hoping to get into the Marshal Service, hoping to become a state trooper, hoping to do something better. Um, it's also an enormously inefficient, incompetent agency, um, demonstrated over and over again. Its impact has been scandalously magnified by the news media, excuse yeah. me, gentlemen, and my former colleagues. <laughs> Every frigging time, you know, one, one guy gets picked up, dropping his kid off to school, and it's a loop, and it goes on for years. You look at the actual record. ICE was only able to manage significant numbers of removals under the Obama administration when it had a conduit to jails under a program that was called Secure Communities. As soon as that was taken away, the numbers plummeted. They are incapable of efficiently, I mean, there are 10, 11 million unauthorized immigrants around the country, and most everybody knows where they are. You, know, you can actually manipulate census data and show exactly where they are. Um, ICE is incompetent. You know, they, they, they announce these operations. 300 officers with a list of 250 people, six months in the planning, they pick up 50 people. You know, with an enormous expenditures of time and money and manpower, they are enormously incompetent. If, if the news media re reported accurately about ICE's ability to conduct its mission, in the United States, you realize it's a bunch of tin soldiers. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one thing about ICE? Yeah. <clears throat> Not about bad apples, but about, um, and it, look, I'm, I'll admit, I'm new to this. Um, I wasn't always covering immigration, um, but I have big, you know, gotten a lot of exposure to it in the last uh, couple of years. I did, um, I did go inside Adelanto, which is an ICE detention center about two hours from here uh, out in the desert. Uh, and uh, Adelanto is run by Geo Group, which is a private prison. 
and many of the ICE detention facilities are run by private prisons, which comes with its whole own set of problems, and oversight is one of them. And I'm just giving you Adelanto as an example, and oversight as a larger systemic issue, private prisons is a larger systemic issue with ICE. I mean, a lot of this comes back to how are we treating human beings, and why are they in these places? And Adelanto, um, I remember walking through Adelanto asking, you know, do people ever die in here? And they say, you know, it happens occasionally um, like it would happen in any prison or whatever. Um, the Office of Inspector General released a report about Adelanto maybe a month after I went through there and said over and over, and I saw a person lying on the floor clearly having a mental breakdown in isolation, keeping people in isolation, um, that people were hanging themselves with nooses in the cells in Adelanto. And um, when it comes to oversight, I mean, I don't think it can be stressed enough how big of a systemic issue it is within ICE, particularly in the private prisons that are run. Because ICE has facilities, remember, in all 50 states. Some of them are run by ICE. Many of them are run by companies that give a lot of money mm -hmm. to politicians in the United States in order to have those facilities and be able to have that, that opportunity. What role uh, is and should sanctuary city policy movement play in counteracting anti-immigrant movement? Is it being successful? Is there a role that the sanctuary cities, and, and you can also you think know, uh, of California? I'll, I'll say one. I mean, in L.A. here, uh, the, 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 the LAPD, and full disclosure, uh, my dad sits on the police commission here in L.A., but the LAPD has been um, very outspoken about how um, they don't want to cooperate with ICE because it makes right. our communities, this is LAPD talking, not me, less safe. Um, people are less likely to report crimes. In a city like Los Angeles, um, where I don't know what the statistic is, but certainly quote unquote majority of minority, which is a weird phrase, but um, uh, it, the law enforcement agencies, local law enforcement agencies will say uh, that being a sanctuary city makes all residents of a city safer. Um, and so I think that as far as messaging about sanctuary cities, I don't think there's any message that's more resonant than that, that if you live in a city that protects its undocumented residents, everybody in that city will be safer. People are more likely to report crimes, they're more likely to go to a bank, mm -hmm. not keep a wad of cash under their bed, et cetera, et cetera. So two quick thoughts. One is what um, LAPD says about cooperation with um, ICE um, is almost universally true of law enforcement in the United States. Um, they, they don't want to cooperate. A police. A police. Not Excuse sheriffs. me, police. Police. Yeah, Sorry. Police. 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 Um, they're kind of universally the police are of the view that communities are safer when they're not in that position because people are much more likely to interact with them um, in, a, in a more transparent way. Um, the second, I, from, a, from a pure politics standpoint, I think the sanctuary response, sanctuary city, kind of sanctuary city a movement response um, to the most recent threat from the president was actually quite constructive um, because it took the wind out of his sails in a big way. Um, it was not at all the reaction that he, because the world in which he, uh, the world that he occupies, the, that response made no sense. He thought it was a punishment. Yeah. And the sanctuary citizens were like, like, come sure, on down. Right. Yeah. So, I, so I think there's actually, you know, from a, from a kind of needling um, the, the president of the United States perspective, there's value in that. Yeah. I just, one other point that's like, uh, about sanctuary cities from the point of view of policy. So immigration policy is primarily the domain of the federal government. Hasn't been always, and even since the 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 primacy of Washington, which really is an early 20th century phenomena uh, on immigration policy, there's always been a state and local role, and and it, it there's a valence between uh, a federalist valence as there is in so much else uh, of our public. Uh, life between the federal, state, and local governments playing different roles in, in operating in this very complicated dance, which has been especially true of immigration. So sanctuary, the sanctuary movement, loca local governments that decided they wanted to reach their own decisions about how to treat immigrants have been vitally important in setting national policy. So the Obama era policy, excuse me, of secure communities, was defeated by local governments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, it, it was local governments that took the federal government to court. It was local governments refusing to cooperate. And, and so it's, it's it, this isn't just a little weird, little protesty type of thing. Um, it's a vital part of the way how policy gets made. And pushing back, doing innovative things, saying, no, people should get driver's licenses. Well, now there are 
what is are we up to 20 states yet we're close we're close we're, close. we're at the point now where probably 80, 90 percent of the unauthorized population lives in states where they can get driver's licenses. I mean, Texas is, and Florida are really the big exceptions now. Um, so these things are, it's, it's important policy making. It's and more important as policy making than it is as politics. Uh, this is, this is a, a, an interesting provocation. <laughs> Why should immigrants be pressured to assimilate? It's almost a universal assumption in the United States that assimilation is desirable. I would like to see progressives de-emphasize assimilation as a noble, all-American, quote-unquote, ideal. Right on. I so say you right on. That was a speech on a card, but I'm down with that. Uh, yeah. I'm down with it. I mean, pressuring people to become citizens, pressuring people to learn English, pressuring people, you got to go to college, buy a house. I mean, Latinos were... This was shoved down their throats in the aughts. To be an American, you got to buy a house. You got to learn English. And they bought houses. And Wells Fargo took them down the merry path. And you, had the, the, you wiped out a decade's worth of work by very, I mean, people who had nothing to begin with uh, and were talked in. They were talked into this idea that if you're going to be an American, you got to buy a house. And they sure did. And they got totally ripped off. You got to have bank accounts. I mean, this is. It's the assimilationist argument and the way it conveys into integration, I think, is, is, um, uh, is, is terribly fraught. Should and we be it, part of the argument among progressives? Well, yeah, I'm being pragmatic be. towards 2020. Right. Well, I mean, so engaging in home country politics, uh, which is not assimilationist, has proven repeatedly in the United States the fastest way to build a civic culture which produces effective politics here. So the Miami Cubans, the best example of people who refuse to assimilate, organize themselves politically around home country politics. They are by far the most powerful group of Latinos in politics anywhere in the country. The Irish organize themselves about home country politics. They remain focused on issues back home. They are the first of the transatlantic migrants to create a really vivid political culture here. So the, the, the notion that assimilation actually improves the lives of migrants um, is known to be false. I mean, how many transnational businesses, I mean, how many prosperous Mexicans in the United States are prosperous because they've kept ties and, and have managed to utilize them? It's a fascinating topic. What do you think? No, no, no I, I, I'm, I largely agree with that. Um, and, I, and I actually, I think, um, and obviously, not all migrants in the United States today are, are Latino, um, which is also something that's very important um, that, that kind of gets lost in some of this conversation. Um, that, that we, yeah, that we, that we went down that rabbit hole um, <laughs> about an hour ago. Um, that it, it's also true of the world in which we live, right? That the ability to be both here and there um, is much more present and much more real today than it's ever been. Um, less so than it'll ever be, probably. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's fine, right? Um, I've, got, I've got daughters um, that, that, that mentally associate themselves with three different countries. Um, and I see that as, a, that as strength for them and kind of value additive for them. Um, so, and, and beyond the kind of practical um, perils of the integrationist um, uh, or assimilationist um, argument, um, and the home in the home country politics thing. I mean, today is a shining example, if you want to use that word, um, of how um, misguided home country politics can continue to manifest themselves. In the case of Cuba um, today, where the administration you know triples down on a policy that failed for sixty years, but apparently this is this is the thing that was this is the thing that was missing. Um, but but shows how captive um, and how effective political organization around home country politics can be. You you are from LA, and for me this this city in which I've lived for almost eight years is absolutely fascinating for many different reasons. One of the reasons is precisely what we're talking about the Hispanic community. What, what do you think of of this question in light of of, of the city of of Los Angeles? Uh, the coolest is it's not just Latinos, but obviously of course. Um, 
the co- I think one of my favorite things about living in L.A., I don't know what, again, the official stat is, but you could go to LAUSD schools and hear 100 and yeah. something languages uh, spoken. That's just what Los Angeles is. We live in one of the most diverse cities in the world, and that is um, that is Los Angeles. I don't have much more to add. I mean, these guys are right on. The, the speech on the card was right on. Um, and, uh, and, I mean, that's the greatest, that is the greatest thing about living in L.A. Yeah. I'll give you one factoid on this. So a uh, study was done now many years ago of immigrant families, not just Latinos, mix of, of immigrant families. Um, the question was measuring delinquency among teenagers against the language spoken in the home. Mm. Right? So the variables are they sp- the, the immigrant parents with native-born children spoke English in the home versus spoke the home language in the home. Which of those two do you think was correlated with higher rates of delinquency? Well, yeah, you knew the answer already. You, you know. <laughs> that was easy. Right? Yeah, because they, it was a, a breakdown of the familiar culture. Mm-hmm. Parents were speaking a language they didn't speak well. Right. The children were speaking back to the parents in a language that the parents didn't understand. Um, and more than that, it was a, it, you, you broke down the essential, culturally specific parental roles mm. and tried to right. adapt to American parental roles before people were used to it. So, I mean, I grew up in a household where if I spoke English to my father, he swatted me. Yeah. <laughs> no, if I, I, and if I didn't speak English, with, if I spoke English with any accent, he would swat me. Right. I say, Quite I say, a childhood. Right. I say this all the time. Hey. <laughs> said, you, you, know, you, you should you go to the guy in meditation right, after this. Right, 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 right. Right. A lot better. You could, you could uh, the, the, talk the, to my therapist, the many of right. them. <laughs> I, I've said this more times than I can, I can remember. The, the most valuable thing my parents did for me, I think, um, the single most valuable thing, <laughs> probably certainly professionally for me, is they didn't speak a word of English to me. Yeah, no, my parents refused right. to. Right. Um, Oof. And and it, that's certainly been value additive in my life. So we have time for a couple more questions, quick ones. So, uh, do you think that the Mexican president should confront Trump over his agenda? I think that's for you. Department, come on, Dan. I think that's for you. No. Well, no, he, <laughs> well, you know what he did when he was asked that question. No, so he this came up at a rally last well, week. Well, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. I said do know. To a big public. Do, do you, you think, think I should respond to Trump? Do you think I should Trump? respond to Trump? And they all said, no. no. Right. That's then, my people. And then the people had spoken. That's yes. my think tank, he, yes. he yeah. said. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. The people They're had absolutely spoken. Right. Why would anybody respond to Trump? Nobody should respond but to a, Trump. But there's a difference, since you threw it my way, there's a difference between not responding and legitimizing his nativist, nativist rhetoric. He, he, he recently said uh, in these daily news conferences that he has, very awkward ones, uh, increasingly so. <laughs> increasingly he, so. He, he, he said... He said, he has this vision of immigration, and I find it to be legitimate. How can you say that? Really? But, but, but listen, and, and to, to be quite provocative, um, one of the more eye-opening experiences I had in government was one of my very first trips to Mexico City um, to sit down with Mexican government officials. This is two Mexican governments ago now, um, to talk about the issue of migration. Uh, and we talked a great deal about our border, um, our shared border. Um, and then they presented on their southern border. Um, and it was eye-popping. It was like listening to Steve King and Absolutely. Donald Trump oh, and yeah. discuss oh. migration. Um, and, and I, I kind of knew it to be true, but it was, it was, it was quite interesting <laughs> to hear. Uh, and recent polls show right. that so Mexicans are right. pretty nativist. Right. I mean, so, pretty yeah, so nativist. Nativist. Again, nativism is not the unique purview of the United States. Um, I, I actually don't think... <laughs> Uh, it, obviously, legitimizing it is one thing. I don't think there's a whole lot of reason to engage because, again, when Donald Trump is talking about Mexico and Mexicans, Donald Trump is talking about neither Mexico nor Mexicans. Um, and there's nothing the Mexican government can do to change that. The last Mexican government was under the misguided impression that there was something. They could suck up enough that it would somehow alter behavior. They sucked up a lot, <coughs> didn't alter behavior. Uh, um, <laughs> That, and I also just don't expect Andres Manuel López Obrador to engage on this because Andres, Ma- uh, Andres Manuel doesn't care about anything that happens outside of Mexico. Just it's who he is. Even um, when there's 
30 million people yeah, of Mexican it, origin. It, yes, but, but he is very much about you know, the four corners, if you will, of Mexico. He, and he doesn't kind of look beyond it as, mm. as who he is as a political creature. Yes. And he, and he romped an election. Yeah. He's, he said as much. Okay, last question. Uh, Jacob, since, since you're a colleague, uh, I don't know if you want to answer this one, but uh, if you want to, it would be wonderful to hear your answer to this question. <laughs> oh, it's shit. A very, no, it's a very simple one. So, which of the many presidential candidates best expresses the most viable alternative to Trump? Oh, I thought you, you're going to him, though. You're going to him, yeah. No, I'm going to all of you. Yeah. Maybe even myself. Pass. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give it and post it online. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the Lopez Obrador answer. I'll let the people decide. <laughs> who do you think? Let's do a poll. Oh, but before that, who do you think? Well, I'm the comments of my two colleagues here <laughs> and the conversation we were having at length in the green room. It, wow. it's, it Nobody is willing to say, which is a really bad sign. I disagree that that's a really bad sign. Okay, it's well, early, it's early right. days yet. Yeah. Okay, who who thinks uh, well, Sanders? Who, who, who thinks Sanders is the best alternative? Okay, one person. No. Ber Bernie's cousin. Two. Okay. Three. <laughs> uh, Kamala Harris. Wow. Yeah. Joe Biden. There's one. So there's only Republicans there's in one. the audience, maybe. Yeah. No. No. This is, you're proving my point. Should, should we have asked Major, Donald Trump? Major Pete? Pete? Pete. Wow, three people for Pete. Wow. Three it's four, early, yeah. see? It's early days. What? Stacey Abrams hasn't, uh, She's well. not in. Who else? Beto O'Rourke. Beto O'Rourke. Beto. There's so many. We'll be here until 10. Two, three. <laughs> exactly. We got like yeah. Uh, All right. I, I think, I think everyone, I, I think, think this proves the point. They're so. Excited. Our think tank, like Lopes Obrador would say, yeah. is as undecided it, as I we are. I find it depressing. <laughs> Thank you all very much for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks.